Wait, wait, wait. What does each engineering discipline even do? Well, in this video, I interviewed every engineering discipline in my university from mechanical, chemical, electrical, civil, and all the rest to answer these questions. I'll leave timestamps throughout the entire video in case you want to skip to a particular discipline, but I fully recommend that you should watch through the entire thing because you never know, you might just find yourself resonating with a discipline that you had no idea about. First, we're gonna talk about mechanical engineering. First, we're gonna talk about why students should join mechanical engineering, the difference between co-op and trad, common misconceptions about mechanical engineering, the courses you take as a Mechie student, potential extracurriculars, touching on the space industry, what attributes a Mechie should have personality-wise, and the biggest piece of advice that our student Brandon has for students that are struggling with the engineering workload. So I'm Brandon. I'm a fourth year mechanical engineering co-op student. I'm a plan one co-op student. So I'm currently in the uh, second semester of my, my third year courses. Yeah, I'm just a Mechie. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, why did you join mechanical engineering? So I joined Mechi for probably a lot of reasons Mechi's joined. I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I knew I liked to see things move and I knew that I liked to see things actually be built. I wasn't into like chemistry necessarily where it was like, oh, this is a lot of theoretical. I am going to work with this stuff. I don't necessarily see it. I did enjoy kind of like, oh, this is the kinematics and kinetics of how pieces moved. So I figured Mechi was there. It was broad. And it allowed me to like kind of figure out more what I want to do um, as I move forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, just to add on to that, that um, Meki is known for being the broadest discipline. Yeah. Um, and, and because it's the broadest discipline, it opens you up to the most industries. I like to call it like a generalized engineering. Yes. Meki 260, our professor had, um, reiterated again and again that um, mechanical students or mechanical graduates are most likely to be in a manager position. Being the broadest discipline allows you to be in a broad um, area, which is being a manager. Yeah, exactly. Level. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think like I saw that very firsthand. Like they need, like at my job, they needed mechanical engineers, but they still had a lot, but they were all in manager positions. You have so many like different hats you can put on, electrical, chemical, civil, whatever, yeah. uh, that you can understand what almost any of them are going to say. Whereas like, a chemical and electrical might not have the same terminology. I think this is a good time to define some things that um, are in uh, engineering. Co-op being a one-year extension of just basically, um, instead of having breaks in between schools, um, you have uh, work terms. And these can be eight months. I believe there's some that are 12 months. Yep, there's some 12 months. And four months. Co-op is just really there to help... Uh, help you find jobs and start getting an actual work experience. So the university, they have a lot of contacts actually in industry and they built relationship with a lot of these people. So they're kind of like, hey, um, these students in their first year, they had good GPAs. That's typically how you get into co-op. You, um, Everyone wants it. The co competitively, it just forces your GPA to be higher. So they kind of go to like these businesses being like, hey, like these are some of our best students. Um, we want them to have jobs and we want you guys to start like vetting some of these engineering students. Like this is a, this is a great way for like uh, businesses too, right? Like right. they're going to come in and they're going to see, Oh, I'm going to test this kid out four months, eight months, 12 months. It's real, real low risk to them. And like a lot of like ups for them, like the, it's cheap for them to like pay us. It's uh, they get to see what we're like. We get the experience too. It's kind of a win-win situation. Yeah. And it's a good way to like find future employers. Exactly. But on the other hand, you have your traditional route. Yeah. Um, which is what neither of us is doing right now. Yeah. I mean, trad's still very good, I think. I think I know some people who went and just took a year off, like 16 months off and found a job. Honestly, trad has a lot of benefits too. You can do, you can really like play with it whereas co-op you're a lot more like rigid i find in a lot of ways i mean yeah. what do you think i i find that like oh i have to take these courses in, in these times which is good because i know i'm all what i'm always going to do um but you don't always get that flexibility yeah i'd say that because there are the ga those gaps those summer gaps that uh, trad has it does give a little bit more flexibility and does introduce some level of oh I can move stuff around. Um, maybe if these courses don't work out for me early on, I can maybe move these over into the summer term, spring terms. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of benefits to co-op and a lot of benefits 
the trad. Speaking on like what you said about GPA and like having GPA a h- higher GPA in co-op, I, I would agree, but um, I wouldn't say that you would necessarily one hundred percent need a high GPA, quote unquote mm. high GPA. Yeah, yeah. You don't need a you don't need a four point oh necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> Unless you're yeah. going biomed, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know that we've taken the same courses and yada yada yada. Mm-hmm. But can you comment on some of the courses that we've taken and kind of highlight one of your favorite courses that we've taken? Sure. So I mean, like the general Mechie courses that we've taken, I like everything we've done involves something moving, even if we can't see it moving. Like um, lots of the courses I remember, like heat transfer, ECE, involves something moving and yeah. like figuring out how to model that moving, which is how I would describe most of Mechie is like whether it's like oh I'm gonna model a gear and how that moves, I'm gonna model flow of water or what any any liquid really or flow of anything, heat, um, electricity, you kind of like, that's how I kind of think of Mechie now. Yeah. yeah. Even just to add on to that, um, not only is there just stuff moving, but you also need a background in when stuff doesn't move. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when the sum of forces equals zero. <laughs> exactly. So you need to know when F equals zero and yeah. when F equals MA. Yeah. If I could say one course I really loved was 230. That was when like first introducing to fluid, uh, fluid statics, yeah. mechanics, and yeah. heat transfer. I really enjoyed that, but that was mostly because of the professor. Um, yeah. I, I, that professor was amazing. But it also like showed me what fluids was, and fluids is like one of my favorite areas of mechani- mechanical engineering. Oh, why? I, I just always think it's interesting because like, realistically, that's how like we use fluids in just about everything to power our world. Like All turbines are powered through steam, or like most power plants are steam power plants that push turbines. Like Fluid just does so much in our world, I think. Yeah. And I just think that's really interesting to me. And it's not even it's it can go from the movement of product through in a pipeline, yeah, pipeline. to uh, moving over a vehicle. One of the the best things I learned in that that Mechie two thirty class, that fluid dynamics mm-hmm. class, we learned why the golf ball has dimples on it. Yeah, something so simple like I that. Know. You like we we see it every day, but we never think of it. That 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 is what really I think is interesting about Mechie too. Is like mm-hmm. we look at some real examples where you're like. Oh, I never thought, like you said, the golf ball. I never questioned that. And it, it kind of forces you to question some things sometimes. So speaking on the extracurricular side, mm-hmm. what kind of clubs related to mechanical engineering have you, be, have you been a part of? The one that I've been doing more work with recently is Alberta Sat. Um, they're the CUBE satellite team um, here at the U of A. And I've just been joining the mechanical team recently. So I'm kind of doing some things like trying to figure out like, a volume budget, how we're going to like put everything into uh, the CubeSat. Um, I've been trying to figure out heat transfer of that. Like, uh, just because you're in space doesn't mean there's no uh, heat. Like, we still have heat generation and we have to dissipate and we have to figure out how we can model that. Like, sun's going to be hitting it. Um, and we got to figure out how we make sure everything doesn't like overheat. So I've been doing some new work with that. This is like the best way, like one of my key advices that I have for students is that clubs um, that are rather related to your discipline or not, Mm -hmm. they're great for building your passion and for building um, additional knowledge on top of your your studies. A hundred percent. Like when you can find something, like you're saying a passion, you can start applying. Like that's a big thing. Like you can get really passionate about trying to send something into space. Yeah. Um, like I, I've just taken a bunch of million courses, so I'm hopefully able to help build something that goes into space. Like that to me is super cool. I'm That's not sure so how many cool. people can say that. And it like, it starts to help you figure out how I actually use these things. Like I was saying on the thermal side, like I learned about heat transfer. I don't necessarily, th- I didn't know how to actually think about heat transfer in a real sense. Like how to apply it. And stuff exactly. Like, like I, I didn't know how to apply the effects of radiation in yeah. space like that isn't something that i thought of naturally yeah so th- there's a lot of ways to start applying um all these thoughts so in terms of personality what do you think kind of attributes that they should have when joining the program i would say the people who really succeed in mechanical engineering are the people who question like a yeah. lot of the things around how us does stuff work how does this yeah how does this work another attribute is like people who really like design um, mm. a mechanical engineering, like the program has three design courses. Every other one has a one, maybe two. And you, if you're into design, I mean, by like actually building things with your hands, um, or just wanting to do things like on CAD, that's a big part of, that's a big part of design too. Yeah. Uh, 
I would say those kind of people like really succeed because they're just like, oh, I want to build, I want to do these little things and do analysis too. There was one point that the professor made that really stuck out to me and was that um, during our design of like the whatever robot kind of thing that we yeah. were building, he said that make sure to be open to allowing other people to try out different things hands-on mm -hmm. because some people in mechanical engineering have never picked up a screwdriver. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is very true. So it, it it's, a, it's a common misconception that um, you need to be like mechanically like minded or whatever right um to go into mechanical engineering but uh, i would entirely disagree yeah i guess i sorry i just didn't i didn't mean that you had to be like that mechanically inclined oh, i no. guess i meant like you want to create things yeah. maybe that's i didn't necessarily mean oh you have to build like a transmission on your weekends <laughs> um but you can like if you want to like build things like that i think is really important, like that the drive to want to build, I think. So what is your kind of one piece of advice for anyone that wants to join the program? Have a limit on your day. Don't, it's so easy to- Just keep working. Work 14 hour days. I've done it, it sucks. Yeah. You burn yourself out and you do worse. I mean, uh, there's gonna be days where you have to work till seven or eight or 9 p.m. at night, maybe later, and never focus on a problem that I can't solve for more than 30 minutes. Ask people, talk to people, find a group is a big thing too. Like I have a good group of guys that all of us can be like, hey, like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's <laughs> going on in this class, man. Can you help me out? Explain something to yeah. me, please. Um, so have a group and like have a time limit on your day. I would say the big things. Next, we've got electrical engineering. And here we'll talk about why students should join EE, the different branches and careers you can take on in electrical engineering, what kind of courses you take on in electrical engineering, what Ethan, our student here, did for his co-op terms, why electrical engineering has a reputation for being the hardest discipline. I don't know about that one, but... And personality attributes will be the last thing we talk about in a student that wants to succeed in electrical engineering. Uh, my name is Ethan Com. I'm in third year co-op EE, uh, and I'm in electrical engineering, aka EE. Um, did I miss something? No? No? All right, good. I feel a little tired right now. <laughs> uh, so why did you choose your discipline? To be honest, I kind of went down the electrical route because I wanted to work more with hardware stuff anyways, and now that's all I know. Like, I take much more in-depth classes with a lot of electronics stuff, and electronics is kind of what I've always wanted to do. Other areas with EE that makes it nice, there's the fact that you can go into, like, just a billion different industries, you know what I mean? You could be working at TELUS and getting people TV service to their house, telecom stuff. You could be working with power, you know, only reason this room's glowing. Uh, electronics, how this works, and a bunch of other stuff. You can even work in, like, the audio industry. So something I've, I've thought about that'd be cool is, like, work in audio electronics, you know, work for Sony, get the headsets running or whatever. Ooh. I know, right? There's photonics. It's how all TVs work nowadays that are 4K, right? It's all nanoscale. And same thing with uh, nanofabrication. So kind of relating back to compi stuff, too. A lot of that is uh, e-nano stuff. Uh, there's control systems. There's so much other stuff. And I kind of just, it's kind of nice because I'm a really indecisive person. So let's say five years from now, I just get bored of whatever I want to go into. 180 route, go a different way, like so many different things. There's even EEs that work in programming. So even though I'm a bad programmer, maybe I get good at it. Uh, embedded systems programming is entirely electrical engineers. Yeah. Cool. Feeling good about my prospects, hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of the courses, what do you learn in school? So in second year, you basically kind of get an overview of all the stuff that you do, right? So you kind of get like an intro to circuits classes. You get... Um, intro to a bunch of math that they swear you're going to use and you never end up using. <laughs> yeah. um, then when the third year comes around, that's when you actually start to learn E stuff. You feel less like a glorified science student. You feel more like an engineering student. So last semester I had an intro to power engineering class, intro to embedded systems class. It's all intros to the different branches I was mentioning before, right? Uh, intro to kind of um, digital signal design, which is stuff with how audio and visuals work on screens and stuff like that, right? Um, 
And then second semester, third year, I haven't taken that yet. But when that comes around, it's it's just more of the same. It's kind of either adding on to stuff from before. So electronics too, where you start to get into stuff with like um, gates, transistors and all that and how everything you use actually works. Fourth year is where it really kind of the gates are open. I, I have a lot of friends in fourth year and they've told me it's basically like a choose your own adventure game kind of Okay. because compared to a lot of other departments, uh, the ECE department basically lets you pick whatever. So people will take stuff and like microwave electronics. It's where you get all the weird names Whoa. coming in. Yeah. Photonics introductory to nanofabrication, telecommunication and signal design and like all, all the all the fancy buzzwords that people love using. And that's where you really like if let's say you really hard set on something right off the gates, that's where you'd pick kind of what classes you'd want to take based on that. A lot of the classes I will say are, are math classes in disguise. It, this was a warning I got in second year, and man, is it ever true. You'll think, wow, I'm done all my math classes now. This is great. And then like EC240, for example, uh, discrete signal analysis, it's it's just a math class. Like it's not, it's not calculus, but it's like weird math. A lot of stuff in EE is very like governed by um, equations and math and all that because it's not like, you know, it's not like a gear. You can't see a photon of light as it's shooting through the air, yeah. right? You can't see tiny little uh, gate that's like two nanometers wide yeah. <laughs> in your computer, right? So you have to work with like the math to make sure stuff doesn't weird itself out. Right. So that's, I think that's a big part of it. Um, so yeah, that's probably why. Uh, so in terms of your co-ops, uh, is this your first co-op term that you're in right now? I'm in my second, technically. The sequencing for E is a four month in the summer after second year. You go back to school for four months and then you do an eight month, school for four months, eight month, and then you do your final year. So I'm in my first eight month, uh, the second month into it. Oh, sweet. And tell me a little bit about what you did for your first and second ones. Uh, yeah. So my first one, I got really lucky. I got a, an electrical engineering related one. I ended up doing a lot of stuff, mostly just learning about like uh, control systems and panel design. So basically like... You know when you go in your basement, you see where all the breakers are? Yeah. Picture that, but for like a giant conveyor belt at a factory. Or picture that, but for like a traffic control stop. Kind of how all that stuff's designed. Uh, did some stuff in AutoCAD. And I, weirdly enough, I think directly because of that, I got my current internship at uh, DriveWise, where I'm basically doing the same thing, but actually engineering. I don't know, it's pretty cool. Like. They use like cameras to take automated photos of trucks and then they use thermal imaging cameras that like, yeah, they try to like, because if the tire is really hot, that means it's probably overinflated. And then they send this info to the Department of Transportation people that are working at the booths that we set up. Okay. So then they'll be like, oh, this truck should pull in, hit the button, and then the truck pulls in. So yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much like okay. automating... Um, what the police do, but instead it's like Department of Transportation stuff for semi trucks. Ah. So yeah, yeah. I read thermal imaging in the job app, and I was like, "Let's do it." That sounds cool. Okay, so out of the most popular disciplines, like uh, I, li I like to say, like the most pop, like the big four: um, mechanical, civil, electrical, chemical. Mm -hmm. um, those just seem like to be the big four that people mostly will like tend towards, mm -hmm. like in the first year. Mm -hmm. Um, electrical seems to have like a reputation for being the hardest one. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can you like comment on that and like how, how much truth is behind that? I think it depends on the day between Mechie and EE. There's just a lot of hypothetical heebie-jeebie stuff, right? You'll literally be doing these calculations on a thing and you're like, what is this? Like, What's I know this on? is, well, yeah, cause you're like, I know this is useful, but man, this is some weird wizard stuff, right? I like to refer to it all as wizard math. Yeah. To be honest, there's some stuff that you do and you touch on that like you won't even really be able to fully understand. In my power class, there was this equation that they're just, they're just like, just use it. Cause you, if <laughs> just I looked in the textbook out of curiosity and it's this like, this derivation here and this one here and this one here and they all plug together into this weird like jumbled mess. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the units work out. That's all I care about. <laughs> don't, so don't worry about a lot of stuff we work with is tiny, right? Um, it's It like just really complicates things. <laughs> like they're applying it to weird quantum phenomena. Like, uh, you know that weird stuff that you'd hear about yeah, yeah, on the yeah. science channel as a kid? Yeah, you start doing it. So in terms of personality, 
What kind of student should join this program? <laughs> uh, people who want to get really far away from copies. <laughs> it really helps when you're in a class and when you're doing it, you're going, oh, wait, if I know how to do this, I can go home, I can whip out a breadboard and I can like make a heinously dangerous circuit. But maybe, maybe if I do it right, it'll make like a, I'll make an amplifier and I can plug in a speaker into it and I can like, you know, that's, that's one of our labs. I'm saying that as an example, but it, the more curious you are about stuff, the better, because you can toy around with stuff in EE like no one's business, right? A lot of other civil, what are you going to do? You're going to build a house? <laughs> like, how are you going to test to make sure everything you go works? You're going to go sum of forces equals to zero on a plank? No. Like, yeah. but with EE, a lot of the stuff you can do, there's so much hobbyist stuff. I'm sure you've seen it online. Oh, no, definitely. There's so much you can do in your free time that if you're curious, if you're, you know, if you're passionate about stuff, if you want to make a computer, go make a computer. Like it, you can do that. There's the Elko garage. There's all these resources, right? There's all these clubs that you can do it in. So th those are probably the people I'd stray towards E. If you can make it into the discipline, choose EE. If you can't, uh, say la vie, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, sometimes you get stuck at the bottom, but you passed, you made it through first year. Congratulations. Next, we've got computer engineering, and now we're going to talk about what is CompE and why students should choose CompE, the courses CompEs take, how CompE is related to and different from software engineering, and Anushka, our students' co-op experience, including terms with BlackBerry and Microsoft, and the hardware side of CompE is just some of the things that we'll be talking about here. So my name is Anushka, and I'm uh, in computer engineering. For what year? For fifth year. Sweet. So last one. Last one. Almost there. <laughs> awesome. Tell me, like, what is computer engineering? So computer engineering, to me specifically, is a study of um, everything technology. So all the cutting edge things that are going out there, um, we get to study them, or at least build foundations to understand um, what those new advancements are going to be. So in some of our courses, for example, we're learning about microprocessors. We're learning about how those computers are made at the very, very low level. And then, so after going from that low level, we're learning about how those computers interact with each other, and then also how you build like apps, things like that on your computer, how you do machine learning, how you do artificial intelligence. So it goes from the absolute basics to some cutting edge stuff that's relevant now um, in the in today's world. I have a course right now, um, Compute 366, which is all about AI and pathfinding algorithms. So um, just learning about the mathematics and the concepts related to AI. So before you can go and build your next chat GPT, you need to understand how you optimize those algorithms. And that's exactly what that course is kind of helping you do. Oh, that's sweet. So well, tell me first of all, why did you choose your discipline? When I came into engineering, I quickly realized that my passions do lie um, in technology and like mm -hmm. really to coding and making something work uh, after coding it out and creating a tangible product seemed way more interesting to me than, um, you know, kind of finding the force of friction, things like that. Yeah. No dis mechanical or civil. We love you. Um, but that's that's why I was drawn in. And then everything that's happening around us, right? All the kind of job opportunities that lie out there um, kind of drew me into the discipline as well. I thought it was a very good field to go into, to um, grow and be involved at the very forefront of um, everything that's changing with technology. Speaking of um, school, what are some of like the courses that you take? Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll start like maybe in second year. So in second year, we start off with going, still building on your physics. So a lot of, you know, digital signal processing. How do those uh, signals kind of transfer to data? That's one part. Then we have circuits. How does um, electricity and energy flow through um, the circuits? And then it goes on to also understanding more of how the computer works. So once you have the circuit, then that circuit goes and can make more electrical components like your microprocessor. So how does that microprocessor really work? So we have a course just on microprocessors. Then how does that specific you know, piece of technology communicate with other laptops? And right now I'm doing networks. Um, how does the internet work? What's an IP address? Uh, how are packets transferred? What if you lose a packet? How does that then get recovered? Things like that. So that's one of the courses I'm doing now. But with all of that, there's also um, other components that you do more on the high level. 
So high levels, more things that you can like see. Low levels, things like your laptop. You just kind of assume that it works and you kind of go off on it and you don't kind of go through and see what is going on inside of it. So that's more low level. And then high level would be like your apps. So there is a bit of a relation between software engine and compute. Computer. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful、uh, mixture of electrical and software where we get the best of both worlds. We're understanding both low level in terms of how、um, certain technology works, but also being able to apply it into apps. So when we go out in the job market, we're able to, if we want, we can get low level jobs such as you know, doing hardware, or we can get jobs doing software.、Uh, are you in co op right now? I am. Oh well, I finished my co-op because I'm on my last term now. So、ah, right. I finished all my co-op terms, but I,、Sweet. I guess, am still in co-op. So can you tell me just like a little bit about each of those terms? Yeah. So、um, my first internship, I started at Trans Mountain. I started as a cybersecurity analyst. There, basically,、um, I looked at the risks that the organization was facing had according to like their audit that they had done. So after looking at that, then my job on a day to day was following up with stakeholders and then、um, kind of seeing what they were doing about the risk. The second part of、um, that same internship was. Getting more awareness, so I did a presentation to the whole company as a lunch and learn kind of thing, and then our CEO mentioned it in the town hall too. So it was a really good presentation.、Mm-hmm. So that was my first introduction to cybersecurity. Got really interested in that field, and then did all my internships in the field of cybersecurity as well. So second one, I went to BlackBerry.、Um, I did a lot of cloud architecture and looking at、um, security in the cloud. So that was all of my second term,、um, and then my third term was at a security consulting company called Iron Spear, and that's where I got a wealth of knowledge. I did vulnerability management. I did、um, so you know you get those like phishing emails. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I worked with my clients, and then I kind of said, okay.、Um, so, so one of our clients was, for example, school. So I worked with them, looked at their newsletter, and tried to engineer. Near a phishing email, essentially sent it out to their staff、oh. so that、um, they could do a training exercise. You know, when your company sends out those emails that you're not supposed to click on,、mm-hmm. and if you do click on it, you get to. You do were a- doing that. I was doing that. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> so I was doing that、um, again. Built out a lot of different kind of scripts. Did a lot of threat intel. So what threat intel essentially is is、um, looking at. All these kind of vulnerabilities pop up, and there, nobody expects it. Nobody kind of designs software to be buggy, essentially. Yeah. But bad guys, all the hackers, find a way, and、uh, you have to keep an eye out in the news to see what is relevant to your client, your client's tech stack, and then identify the, those vulnerabilities, and then let your client know about like an actionable solution that they can implement. Then I worked at Microsoft、um, last summer. Oh.、Um, so. There, I did a lot of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is essentially、uh, like a container engine, and I basically looked at Azure. So Azure is Microsoft's cloud.、Uh, their Kubernetes offerings, and then found vulnerabilities there. And then、uh, my findings were then given back to the team. So hopefully, the team is now working <laughs> on addressing those findings.、Yeah. And then I went back to BlackBerry, doing a lot of cloud architecture security again, and、uh, a lot of data leak protection.、Um, Sort of testing and implementation, so that's、wow. been kind of my co-op terms. And、um, I'm sure that some of the students that are watching right now are wondering. So you've been talking a lot about the software side. Can you speak and comment on the hardware side at all? So in terms of hardware, what I would say is I personally don't have a lot of experience using hardware.、Um, so that's kind of why I guess I haven't spoke about it too much. But from what I have seen is. Based on the specific knowledge that you get in your coursework,、uh, people have used that kind of on their resume and then gotten job opportunities in like building FPGAs and things like that. So,、um, but one thing again to remember is、uh, their side projects probably have a lot of hardware use. Okay. So for hardware, I would say definitely take a lot away from the lab if you're looking for like a hardware kind of job,、mm-hmm. um, and then. Try to project that really well and explain that and highlight that a lot on your resume. If you can explain what you did really well, then yeah, then people know you can work with hardware. Right. Because essentially, nobody's gonna know everything, right? Right.、Um, we're interns. We're just starting out our career, but people want to know that you you're willing to understand how to learn. For my last question for you, you've been talking a lot about software. Do you know what is the distinction between software eng and compute eng? Can you comment on that? So, in terms of the differences between hardware and software, 
the courses that we take are different. So up until second year, everybody's kind of taking the same kind of courses. After third year, I think that's exactly the point where um, as computer engineering, I took about five circuit courses, if I remember four or five, um, the softwares only took one. So yeah, okay. as computer, you do get a lot more exposure to um, hands-on kind of uh, low-level uh, machine assembly language or um, those kind of protocols. As software, you focus, uh, you turn your attention a little bit more to the um, courses offered by CompSci. So they, um, some of your electives then become what is the math behind all your AI and machine learning algorithms? I see. So it, it goes from the physics with uh, all the microprocessor, uh, electricity, signal processing, all of that versus they might be focusing a little bit more on machine learning, AI, uh, Android app development or any sort of app development, things like that. So that's a little bit of the distinction there. The difference is really in the courses and the things that we learn. But in terms of the jobs that you can get out there, very similar, very similar jobs that you can get out there. Awesome. But also as a compi, I'll say, as a compi, I can take a software job, but a software can't take my job. Oh, <laughs> shots fired, shots fired. Next, we've got chemical engineering, where we'll talk about what chemical engineering is and the biggest misconception about chem E, which is one of my favorites. It's not about chemistry. How chem E is applicable to student satellite groups, possible industries for chemies to work in, from oil and gas to makeup industries. And lastly, some of the best advice for those nervous about university engineering. Yeah, so my name is Nikhil and I'm in my fourth year of chemical engineering traditional. Hey, sweet. So briefly tell me exactly what is chemical engineering? So contrary to common belief, there's very little chemistry in chemical engineering. Chemical engineering really, in my opinion, should be renamed to process engineering because that's really what we do. So. An example I give people is you have a coffee machine. So the entire process from getting, you know, your beans, your coffee beans to an espresso that you drink, mm -hmm. designing that entire process is what chemical engineers do. Oh, okay. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear from a lot of high school students is that they believe that if they're good at chemistry, that they should be in chemical engineering. So can you just touch a little bit more on that? Just how chem chemical engineering is not necessarily entirely chemistry. Yeah, so it's not entirely chemistry. We do use a good amount of chemistry. For example, we design reactors with different uh, chemical reactions. So how fast the reaction goes, how slow the reaction goes, catalysts and whatnot, you need chemistry for that. But at the high level, we look at, okay, ignoring the reactions, how many reactors do we need? So it's really high level what the process is, rather than just the chemistry. Can you tell me about some of the courses that you learn in school? Well, it's actually very similar to mechanical. We mm -hmm. do have heat transfer as well, fluid dynamics. Yeah. I think where it starts to differentiate is gonna be your reactor classes. So we learn about mm -hmm. the different types of reactors, how they work, and then in our later years, we learn how to design the reactors. Um, so you're given an input pressure and you have an output pressure. What systems do you need in order to get those, meet those criteria? So we take a lot of those kind of classes, we take um, basic organic chemistry and chemistry classes, right. lots of lab and technical report writing classes. And yeah, trying to remember lots of, yeah, mostly reactor classes and numerical methods, very similar to mechanical. Engineering. So I know you as one of the biggest parts of one of the most major science clubs in our university. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Just what you've kind of done for your club, what your club is about. Yeah, so I'm the program manager for Alberta Sat. I've been on the team for over four and a half years now. I actually joined when I was in high school in oh. my last year. So the team, for those that don't know, they work on designing, building, and sending satellites to space. And then when they're in space, we operate the satellites. So right from, you know, I have an idea of something that can be in space to I'm sending com commands to a satellite in space. That's when it's like, okay, that's really cool stuff that we do. So I joined on the mission design team back in 2019, and I was doing a lot of orbital simulations, looking at how much power the satellite needs, how many, how much, how often we're going to be able to talk to it, running a bunch of simulations, learning the basics, slowly went up to being a deputy project manager for our last mission, which ended just last year. Yeah, just last year, 2023, where we launched satellites into space and they're in orbit for about three to four months. And then now I'm the program manager. And so... I'm less on the technical side, 
more looking at the entire space program as a whole and how we can help Alberta Sat, Star, Spear, all of us collaborate together to build a giant space program. Mm, so it, it seems that you're super like into project management, like PMing and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and since that you were in Alberta Sat from high school, I'm curious as to why you kind of went through the uh, chemical engineering route instead of, let's say, uh, software, electrical, mechanical. Mm -hmm. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So I'll be real. My first option was not chemical engineering. It was mm. actually mechanical. Um, first year math 100 and my GPA had different ideas um, as yeah. I was in chemical. But looking back, I'm really happy that that happened because mechanical is really, you know, nitty gritty into the details. You know, all the technical aspects. You guys are amazing. You can design anything from scratch. Really cool. Not my cup of tea. Chemical engineering you're, like you said, you look at the process, you're designed to look at the high level system wide thing, right from start to finish at the very high level. And it's very much like a project. When you manage a project, you have, you know, your input conditions, that's what you start with your initial budget, your initial resources, you have a final product or project you need to deliver, right? That's your output. And then much like chemical engineers, project managers work on developing that process, everything in between to make sure that project is a success. Right. So I'm kind of happy. Into that. So what industries does this discipline open you up to? Really anything. So I have friends that went into aerospace. I know people, the obvious one, especially here in Alberta, is oil and gas, energy. I know people that go into pharmaceuticals. One of my friends, she actually works as a makeup designer uh, oh. at, uh, at Sephora. So the entire process of the raw products to making a chemical that you, or a makeup that you can use, that's chemical engineering. So... Anywhere where you start with something and it needs to end as something else, you'll have a chemical engineer. That's involved. sweet. I've never heard of anyone like in like the makeup industry. It's it's huge. There's a lot of people that go in that route. Oh really? Yeah. Well, wow, because when I think chemical engineering, I just think you know the pipelines, it, us being in Alberta and that. Yeah. So is it like a mo majority of our friends also in that too? Yeah. Or? So in in Alberta especially, less pipelines. So with you know climate change and all that, all these big companies right. want to work on making their processes more green, right? More effective. Um, I know companies like Shell, they're doing carbon capture and that's pretty much taking their carbon byproducts and finding ways to cleanly get rid of it. And chemical engineers go there. So more into like energy storage and alternative energies is a big one here in Alberta. Mm -hmm. But the moment you leave Alberta, you've got, you know, out east, you've got all the aerospace, automotive industries down south. You have a lot of that as well. But especially in the UK, big companies like Pfizer, GSK, all kind of engineers. Mm, okay. What is your one piece of advice to any of the students that may be like interested in chemical engineering? So in that first semester of second year, I decided it was a good idea to, while working a job, take eight full-time classes. Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Eight. Don't do that. I can't imagine taking eight, man. Yeah, it was, it was not a fun time. Yeah, so because that failed two classes, not surprising. That was a really rough semester. And then the following semester was pretty much just as rough. And I, I think I ended up finishing that semester with a, I think it was a 1.6 or 1.7. And I was like, this, this is bad. And I was, I would talk to my friends and most of my friends said, you know, you failed math twice, almost three or four times now, cause I failed math 101 twice. Well, you know, maybe engineering isn't for you. Why are you still here? Mm. And that's, that's a very valid question to ask. A lot of people, you fail one or two classes and they're, they're out of here, yeah. right? They think it's not for them. And I don't want people to think that, right? Because I know for a fact that I was passionate about engineering and this is what I wanted to do, right? And I will tell this to anyone. If this is what you want to do, stick it out. The real world problems that can happen to engineers on these projects, much worse than failing a class or two, right? Right. So you got to be able to handle it. And I'm happy that I stuck with it because that was a bad semester. I effectively got a academic warning and I had to appeal the decision. And up until this point, the highest GPA I had gotten was like a 2.3 or 2.4, oh. which, yeah, exactly. It's, Scraping it. <laughs> yeah, barely making it by. And the thing with engineering classes is you're going to do good in them if you genuinely get an appreciation for what you're learning, yeah. right? And if you're taking six, seven, eight classes at a time, you can't do that. You're just fighting to get the next assignment done. Um, so yeah, by me extending and only taking four or five classes, I was like, hey, this material is actually interesting. I like it. And I didn't even think about it like that, but it was just naturally coming to me better. Slowly started doing better on my assignments. Finally got, you know, cleared to 3.0, got above a 3 point something GPA last semester. But then I realized 
that's that's exactly what it is, yeah. right? Engineering, it's going to be tough at the start. You're going to fail a class or two. That's okay, right? That doesn't define who you are. Yeah. I've failed six classes, and I'm still here. And like you said, I'm leading Alberta set. And yeah. failing your classes has nothing to do with you, right? It's the commitment you put into it. I was putting more time into Alberta set. I cared more about it. That's That's where my passion was. And I slowly said, okay, I can be passionate about that, but let me also be passionate about school, right? Let me actually start to enjoy what I'm learning. Think about how we can apply it in the real world. And once I found that passion, that's when the grades automatically on their own just started going up. If you know you want to do engineering, that's where your passion is, stick with it. Fail a class or two. That doesn't define who you are. Stick with it and yeah, you'll get through it eventually. Nikhil, man. Yo, I think we need a round of applause for this man. Next, we've got materials engineering. Here, we'll talk about why students should join materials engineering, courses Maddie students take, tapping into what Maddie actually is, what Daniel, our student here, PhD student, took for his co-op during his undergrad, potential industries that Maddie can take, and what a PhD actually is, and why students may want to pursue one. My name is Daniel Callista. I am in my, well, in my seventh year here at the U of A. Uh, but I'm in my second year of my doing my PhD studies in materials engineering. Why did you choose materials engineering? Grade 11, I saw this video of this hockey foam or foam used in helmets. Hmm. And I saw it being tested for impact resistance and the ability to absorb impacts. And I was like, wow, how does that happen? And then the more I looked into it, the more I'm like, oh, how do I get involved in making these sort of things? How do I get involved in what's behind actually taking like raw material or just stuff in the environment and making it something useful. Mm. And I landed on materials engineering. So I, I I'm very, feel very blessed that I was able to pick out my career still while I was in high school. Can you kind of speak on some of the, your favorite courses or just some brief descriptions on some of the courses that you guys take? Where materials sort of deviates from other the other disciplines is it incorporates aspects of <clears throat> physics, mechanics, and then also processing. What I mean by that is how do you take a sort of material that's like, how do you take just iron? A raw material. A raw material. And you make something out of it. You have to apply a certain processes to that material. Right. And to understand those processes, you have to apply or understand certain physics behind it, like thermodynamics, heat transfer, a huh. little bit aspect of fluid mechanics, solid mechanics, so like stresses and forces. So we kind of group everything together to get a, a fundamental understanding of how we can use processes to transfer or transform base materials to useful materials to then be used in applications. So like, right. for example, stuff in your laptop, the cabling, the solders, the semiconductor chips, that's all materials engineering. How do, Semiconductor chips, you don't find them out in, the, in a cave, right? Yeah. You have to make them and it's a very specific process of understanding the physics uh, is what allows us to make them. So mm -hmm. courses includes things like phase transformations, understanding how uh, something melts, but also something that's like solid, it can have different phases, just like solid and liquid is a phase. Yeah. Something that's solid can also have different two different solid phases or many solid phases. And understanding how those transform and how those evolve is how, for example, in the steel industry, we understand strengthening. Yeah. How do we get some the most out of our steel? Um, mm -hmm. You also learn stuff about corrosion. So that that relates to like integrity and understanding how long is something going to last? Because you can make something. Yeah. But then how long is it going to last in reality? Is So that's another aspect of materials engineering. Um, and then there's also polymers as well. I can't really touch too much on that because that's not my field. But sure. yeah, the, the, the same principles apply. Going back to your undergrad as well. Uh, what, kind, what did you do for your co-op degree for our terms? So I, uh, it's weird for those who are going into co-op, you have to be aware of what plan you're going to be in. In the engineering department here, um, you'll do likely for most of, in general, you'll do three terms, one that's four months and then two more that are eight months. For my first work term, which was for four months, um, different programs have different sequences, but for four months, I decided to reach out to a professor here at the U of A. I spent my first co-op designing undergraduate experiments to be used in the lab courses that ironically I would later take myself. Yeah. <laughs> but I also was able to learn how courses are designed. If you read your syllabus or your syllabi in all your courses, you'll actually see a section called learning outcomes. And if your professor's done them right, 
they've strategically written them just like you would strategically write statements on your resume with an action verb and then a following statement. And you'll notice that those first verbs are actually tailored to the degree of understanding or learning you're supposed to get out of the course. Yeah. So in your fourth year courses, you'll see things like create. In your first year, you'll see uh, things like understand. repeat or understand. Understand's even second level. There's one underneath that, which oh. is repeat. Repeat. Yeah. But that's very basic, but it's, it's a level that needs to be established before you can understand, uh. right? Um, so I learned that. My second co-op, I was able to work at ATCO Pipelines, um, ATCO Gas for in the integrity department, um, where I applied corrosion principles, that sort of thing. My last co-op term is research to see if it's something I can do. Okay. So I used my co-op to actually not only support myself financially, but to gain a full understanding of job perspectives in terms of academia, industry, um, and so I did the, it in the research department at the Soft Materials and Devices Lab in the Chemical and Materials Engineering Department at the U of A under Dr. Chong. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. And speaking of industries, uh, can you kind of touch on what kind of uh, industries does this discipline open you up to and what you are kind of looking into for the industry in the future? Materials engineers can find a niche in anything. There is a understanding to be had in many companies um, in terms of okay, they want to make a new component or they want to make something. In terms of making new things though, like new, new things, like groundbreaking stuff, you, you need to do your grad studies in materials engineering before you go out. I see. But if you want to get right out of the gate and be important in industry and actually contributing, failure analysis is the biggest one for materials engineers. Mm. Companies will have, there's components failing all the time, whether it's in the oil field or even camera sensors, they're, they're failing and everything has a shelf life or an operational life. Companies sometimes want to understand why, because it failed maybe too, too soon, too early. And it wasn't because someone dropped it or spilled Coke on it. Yeah. Um, that's where a material engineer would come in because not only do we have the understandings of how to process things and how to make things, but we also learn how to analyze fracture surfaces. Uh, it's a, so we get a sort of little bit of taste of a detective work in terms of we have this component here like we have a dead body it speaks to us with the subtleties that it has um but it can't talk to us so how do we tell what happened mm. some students would probably be interested in knowing like what is a phd and can you speak on kind of what you do and just introduce the, the idea of a phd you're right you're applying for a doctor in philosophy a doctor of philosophy in engineering science arts whatever it is the doctor of philosophy. So you, you are at the cutting edge, the highest level of thinking possible for that discipline. But the overall, the net goal of a, the, of a PhD, I would say, is to be able to demonstrate an application of understanding in a way that hasn't been done before. Mm. The key thing, one key aspect of a PhD is anything that you do has to be novel. It has to be new. If it's been done before, you're not, it's not satisfactory for a PhD. That's sort of the difference and then the, the step up between a master's and a PhD. A master's thesis, for example, will focus on doing an experiment and understanding what happened in that experiment. But a PhD will do that. And then also, in very basic terms, extrapolate. Yeah. My focus is in welding engineering. And welding is highly interrelated with mechanical and materials as well. If you go to other universities, if they don't have a materials department, because materials is kind of small, it will be a, a subset of the mechanical department. Oh, I see. Um, so I focus on welding and understanding the material processes and the process of welding behind it. So there's a lot of power with understanding and industry pays for it. You just have to find the right, the right spot for it. So what kind of student should join um, undergrad materials engineering? And then at what, at what point should they kind of consider going for a PhD? Materials engineers and most engineers in industry, my opinion, with a bachelor's, you're going to mostly get project management. That's just the bottom line. That's what drives the economy. There's yeah. projects, they need to get done. Money needs to be made. So project management is what you're mostly going to be doing. But that, that's the main issue that I had with going into industry with a bachelor's for me was I'm only going to be doing project management. And don't get me wrong. I like Excel. I like organizing things. My folders are really neat and all that stuff. But I wanted to do more. I wanted to be able to understand certain things. 
uh, why things are. I kept asking myself, I, I kept finding myself asking that question over and over again, why? Why is this thing behave this way when it's hot? It's as simple as those questions, because if you're asking yourself those questions, you should, you're curious, and curiosity is what drives grad school, in my opinion. And now we've got mining engineering, where here we'll talk about why students should join mining engineering, the courses you take in mining engineering, what Grayson, our student, did for his co-op terms, the type of student that might want to join mining engineering, some of the best advice for future mining engineering students, and my personal favorite, how close is mining engineering to Minecraft X-Ray? Let's get to it. So I'm Grayson Panko. I'm a fifth year mining engineering student uh, here at the University of Alberta. So why did you choose your discipline? A sort of looking into mining is it's almost like the jack of all trade engineer. Um, so it really keeps your options open. And I really like that uh, is I could go into it and really once you have a mining engineering degree, there's so many different things you can do and not even, you know, in the mining engineering sphere, but beyond that, if you like being like, on site or, you know, smaller communities, it's really perfect. What kind of courses do you guys take? Yeah, so it's actually funny because we sort of take courses from every discipline. Um, like I said, it's almost the jack of all engineers. Mm. So I've taken fluid dynamics, heat transfer, thermodynamics. Um, we take a couple chemistries. Our first two years are very similar to a civil student. Um, we take survey courses, CAD courses, um, introductory in uh, geology. Um, and then we go into thermodynamics, fluid dynamics. Um, in our sort of first two years, we get all that banged out. And then sort of starting end of second year, going into your third and fourth is when you really start to get into the mining specific ones. So mm -hmm. the way that they approach it is like a mine is a very complex organism. It has a lot of parts and a lot of disciplines within itself. Um, so they sort of split up each one into a course. But in previous years, we've had like uh, mine transport designs. So we deal with mine transport systems, um, surface and underground mining each have a course. So they sort of introduce you to the surface mining environment, the underground mining environment, the methods, how you approach it, sort of deal, how you design it. Do that for underground, do that for surface, um, and then sort of all those other sub-disciplines of, of ventilation or mine transport or equipment selection, um, et cetera, each sort of have a course. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so I'm assuming that you're done all your co-op terms, correct? Yes. All right, sweet. Can you kind of comment on, just briefly on each of them? Yeah, my first term I spent with Clone Crip and Berger. It's a geotech engineering firm in Calgary. Um, so like I said, uh, jack of all engineers, mining engineers. I actually took a civils job for that first term. Um, and that was really great. It was a lot of, basically, it was all geotech design, um, soils management programs, a lot of uh, drafting and engineering design I worked on. It was a lot of office stuff with some, some field mixed in. Um, but I have a special interest in sort of the geotech side. My second term was the big one, the 12 month. Uh, and that 12 was, months. 12 Ooh, months is, it's is big golden. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Um, I spent it with tech and I was working as like a survey technician in the engineering department. That was a really, a real hands-on term. Like I was basically in the field every day. I was there by myself for entire weekends. Um, I was managing, you know, drone operations. I was managing, you know, data operations with the other departments, doing awesome. a lot of organization. But no, like the team up there was a lot of fun. The area is fantastic if you're an outdoorsy sort of person. Um, like I skied over 40 days that year, Whoa. which was pretty, it was pretty sick. You get paid pretty good if you go to a mining company, anybody. Um, I knew people in every department for engineering and they all make pretty good money. Um, so anybody in any other discipline, go to a mining company. <laughs> They'll pay you more <laughs> than everybody else. So in terms of personality and attributes, what kind of student do you think should join this program? Somebody that likes to learn firsthand, like a hands-on person. Um, the mining industry is very fast-paced and, and hands-on, like you learn a lot by being there. So if you want something super office-based and, you know, oh, I just want to design a gear or something, I don't know what you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> um, not not the best for you. You'll, you'll get a lot more uh, benefit out of you know being willing to go places and by go places I literally mean fly somewhere um, and work there. The best mining engineer isn't the best long-range planner or the best drill and blast engineer or the best water engineer. It's the person that's sort of good at all of them not the best at one of them. I see. Because um, you understand the different elements of the system and that's where I mean like somebody that likes big picture um, is you you will get to understand sort of a hand in every pot every element of that operation. But if you really want that opportunity to move around um, and learn, you know, a million different things. Um, that's sort of what, what mining caters to. What is your one piece of advice that you would give to a student that wants to join? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid of mining. I've heard people tell me that they don't do it because they don't want to be bottlenecked. And it's like, well, 
I can I have a bigger breadth of jobs I can do than than most other engineers. Like especially with co-op terms, one of the big things I say to people is don't be afraid to go do something crazy. Like mining, a little bit more than other industries allow you to uh, do a co-op term in a more extreme environment. But yeah, other than that, it's 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 pretty chill. Like if you like if you like small personal uh, interactions, you like more one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, it's definitely the place for you. Like our almost pretty much every professor in the department knows most of us by name. And because of that small, more personal size, I think the second year class is about 40. It's just so much, you get such a, I won't say a better quality of education, but a more personal education. Funny, fun fact in Eng 404, or whatever ethics course we take right now, they do a little presentation where they show you the average uh, entry salary for engineers. Sure. And <laughs> we, Mining. we unironically, well, they just show you like the overall average. Okay. I think the median was like 70, the low was like 65, the high was like 80. And we, <laughs> everybody audibly laughed in the mining room. <laughs> Wait, why? Um, you'll make that much on a co-op. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it in entices anybody, you'll make over six figures in your first job easy. Um, most people make at least 120. Wow. Which is pretty, for an entry, yeah. it's pretty great. Um, for an entry. And that's like everybody that's leaving right now is what they're going into. Right. So just if anybody loves money, um, is a place to be in the job market's crazy. You will get a response to every job you apply for. Okay, so I used to play a lot of Minecraft, right? Okay. A lot of Minecraft. But like, I don't know if you, you know the uh, that mod that you can have that like allows you to see ores. Like, okay, transparent. I think I know what you're talking about. Do, you, do we have that in real life? Like something like that where we have a technology that can scan and find like locations of like ores. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the purpose of the geology and the stats going together. Mm -hmm. So, so stats, geology will tell you the general trends of the area. So they'll say, oh, you know, we have this formation with this bedding and sort of, we uh, expect this sequence of, of rocks and the material, the value mineral is in this sequence. And then stats part. is a probability. And then stats is, okay, now we'll drill it and we'll get samples along the drill hole that we can like actually test and assay and we actually see what's in them. When you go mm -hmm. into a mine, you could... You could take a model of it like Minecraft because you, you'll make a block model, which is like a Minecraft model. It's a, it's okay. a 3D model made up of blocks of a certain size. Um, and each of those blocks is assigned a grade value. So it's assigned, you know, this block has this percent of copper, or this percent of gold or something. Uh, you'll, and then you'll have constructed that before you do your mine. So you'll have this 3D model um, that represents your mining area. Ah, uh, okay. And you could go into any part of that model like Minecraft and say, you know, this specific block that's at coordinate X, Y, Z, um, that's, you know, 600 meters below the surface, what did we model that to be? And you'll have some number, right? Because you'll have, you'll have estimated some number for it. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's literally like a block model is a model of blocks that you <laughs> assign values to based on those. So it's just like a, a, a numeric like an analysis instead of like a there is gold at X, Y, Z. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. an estimation, right? It's right. based off of some, some um, calculation structure. Next up, we've got civil engineering, one of the big ones, where we'll talk about first the governing equation that separates civil students from other students, like myself, <sighs> FNED equals zero. What courses civil students take, what Katrina did for her civil co-op placements, the difference between architecture and civil engineering, possible industries that civil engineers can take, work in, how her non-civvy placements in her club can help her land a job that's civvy related, and advice for the difficulty, the sheer difficulty of engineering. I'm Katrina. I'm in my fourth year in civil engineering co-op. And yeah, uh, that's basically it for like a quick intro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so why did you choose your discipline? During my first year engineering, I was like so interested with F net equals zero. Uh, and then, no. <laughs> and then I, I hate F equals zero. I'm not gonna I lie. I love F net equals zero compared to F is equals to MA. So I was like, I want things to be static. So I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be taking civil stuff for sure. What are some of the courses that you learn in school? Second year, it's more like introduction to like what um, civil is, so like beams like numerical analysis right. whatever and then like some maths and then third year there's an introduction to transpo introduction to water to structural and then project management and now i'm in my fourth year it's leaning towards to what do i need to take 
for my final year in terms of capstones are like more focused and like more not not general anymore. So right. there's that. It's like it's more specialized essentially. Yeah, you could say that. What are the things that you did in each of your work terms so far? For my first eight months, basically I had like 60% office exposure or technical work and then 40% field work. So um, the company exposed me to like on a construction site. So I drive up to Edson or like south of Calgary to like go site visit or whatever. And technical wise, I was able to like analyze data such as like rainfall data. Um, oh land movement and so on and so forth and then yeah there's that for my first eight months and then my second eight months i work at the city of edmonton as a transportation engineering cope student i did traffic counts during rush hour within the city i oh. like analyzed the data like literally a lot of office work and technical like analysis and some sort i was wondering if you could kind of touch on the difference between architecture and civil engineering. Mm. Because okay. yeah. they seem to go hand in hand. But when I hear about them in practice, mm -hmm. um, they seem to have like a lot of disagreements with each other. Um, they're almost like kind of like frenemies. Um, right. So yeah, can you kind of, kind of comment on that? To my knowledge, I feel like the difference between architecture and, and civil engineering is that architecture focuses on the aesthetics of like how a building would look like, how would, it, how would the establishment look like, and so on and so forth. With civil engineering, their purpose is to make the architecture dreams come true. But sometimes it's really hard because like as a civil engineering, you have to take in like, is it possible? I know like a lot of architecture have architecture people I don't know I feel like they're kind of ambitious of course like it's yeah. good to be ambitious yeah. to have like a good aesthetics but then as a civil engineering student or like a civil engineer you have to take in like standards and like the fours if it if it's possible like I've said so yeah that's like my general knowledge in between architecture and civil engineering so so in terms of industries what kind of industries does this discipline open you up to if i recall correctly there is transportation there's structural water resources geotechnical and project management i feel like mm. there's more but it was like a big five like yeah some of the main ones yes essentially. Yeah. exactly so and what industry do you want to take on I would enjoy project management because with my experience with my extra co-curricular, mm -hmm. I'm like leading people. Yeah. So like if I apply the experience to the project management sub-discipline, maybe that will be like a great like connection. Yeah, that was a perfect way to tie it in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so speaking on the extracurricular side of things, um, I know that you're not in a club that's specifically about civil engineering, but this is a good time for representation. Right. Go ahead. I'm one of the executives for FILSA, uh, which is Philippine Students Association at the University of Alberta. Um, I have two executive positions. I have I am the events director and the gala chairperson for this school year. Events director, so I plan internal events from the fall and winter. Me as the gala chairperson, I like I'm the like the main point of contact with everything and yeah. yeah. Yeah, the reason why I brought that up, I just wanted to like share to students like mm -hmm. that there is more to engineering that you can go into right. um, extracurricularly. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that nice of course. representation. Lastly, what yeah. is your one piece of advice to a student that wants to join? It gets easier. I say, I'd say it gets easier. It's really challenging on the ver at the very first part, but you'll get a hang of it. It gets easier and easier, and then you'll be able to manage. How many courses you'll be taking. Now I'm only taking four and four for each term. So eventually you'll be fine. Now we've got environmental engineering. Where first we'll talk about the biggest misconception about environmental engineering. It's not all about saving the environment. The relationship between civil engineering and environmental engineering. The courses that environmental engineering students take. 
what exactly is environmental engineering and then we'll dig into this misconception that I talked about earlier and see exactly what is the difference between environmental engineering and green slash sustainability engineering. Then we'll talk about the future of environmental engineering, the work experience placements that Everett, our student here had, and how a unique work experience placement can integrate biology and environmental engineering together to make a really cool placement. My name is Everett Horner. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm in my uh, fifth year of civil environmental trad. Why did you choose your discipline? Environmental specifically aspect of it. Um, I wanted to um, sort of take that to further my interests in like the environment and specifically like protecting the environment. Um, I definitely didn't have a full understanding at that point of what environmental engineering was. Um, but fortunately, as I've understood it better now, um, I'm still quite interested in what I'm doing. So I saw that um, like a relationship between civil and environmental, they're usually used like together. Um, can you kind of comment on that and like why there's like civil environmental instead of just like environmental itself? The degree uh, for environmental engineering at the U of A is a blended degree um, with civil engineering. So my courses are approximately 50-50 um, between like civi courses and NV courses. Um, and I really like it because um, it gives me sort of a, a more like broad perspective on um, like I still get a lot of like structural engineering. I still get um, some of the more like construction oriented um, knowledge and I get to um, sort of like connect with people in civil engineering as well. Um, but that's the main reason why it's like that, um, because the environmental engineering program isn't actually a separate degree program. It's sort of like housed within civil. Um, it's sort of like you specialize the way you can at the end of a civil engineering degree, but for environmental, you specialize right at the beginning. Speaking on that kind of discrepancy, like the differences between the, the two, um, can you kind of comment on what kind of courses you take as an NV? As an NV, um, you take more courses in um, geotechnical engineering. Um, so we take um, this, we take one that uh, civvies take, but then we take another one that's specifically related um, to uh, like the oil sands tailing um, and like dam stability and that sort of thing. Um, and then we also take courses in site assessment, um, testing and remediation. Um, so like going out and taking field samples. Um, and then one of the big areas that we specialize in is um, water and wastewater treatment. Um, so there's two full courses relating to um, the chemical, physical and biological processes involved in um, drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment. Out of all of those courses, what was your favorite course? The water and wastewater treatment I found really interesting because um, it was like very practical applications of like the chemistry um, and even like um, physics as far as like fluid mechanics because um, we still take like semi 331 which is a, a fluid mechanics course um, and then we apply um, sort of those principles and like how that relates to um, how like things will settle out during like the wastewater or water treatment process um, and then like seeing those processes like applied in a way that you would actually use them in your day-to-day -day job. Um, I, I found that really interesting. What would you say environmental engineering is in your own words? It's literally engineering of the environment. Um, so we're like using environmental processes um, and manipulating them to a certain goal. So it can certainly be applied um, sort of in support of the environment in like preservation, um, conservation, remediation, all that sort of stuff. Um, but it can just as easily be used to like support human development and resource extraction. You kind of mentioned a little bit earlier that there was like a little bit of like a misconception that environmental engineering is not necessarily green engineering. Right. But then you also mentioned that like, if you really love the environment, they should go for it. So like, can you kind of um, clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like if you're interested in engineering, so like I, I decided to go into engineering in general because I was like, I like science and math, but I don't want to be a scientist or a mathematician. Right. Engineering, it just made it the only thing that really made sense. It was like process of elimination for me. If you're starting from that point and then you think, well, I'm like pro environment, whatever, um, unless you specifically know, like, I want to make cars more efficient. Then, yeah. Okay. Maybe you'd be uh, a mechie. Think... But if you're like, generally, you know, I, I want to do things and work in, in furtherance of the environment. There are those opportunities within environmental engineering for sure. Um, and like the skill set or like knowledge base, I guess, that you build um, would be helpful in like furthering those those gains and having a, 
a better understanding of how like different environmental systems work together. Um, but it just doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. There are programs, like I think um, the University of Victoria has a program that's like sustainability engineering. Like that's not what our program is. Um, there's a lot you can take out of it and apply in those areas, but at like face value, what you're learning in class, most of it isn't necessarily like, this is how you protect the environment. Huh. Um, it's just you could take those skills and use them in I furtherance see. of the environment more so than probably like an electrical engineering degree. From what I've heard about that program at like UVic, for example, mm -hmm. that's like more what they focus on is like they learn about like sustainable energy. Like I, I think one of their courses talks about like solar panels and stuff like that. But our, our program doesn't necessarily do that, um, but it could like equip you with the background knowledge that would allow you to more easily get into that space compared to other specializations. Now, in terms of the future, what do you see as the future for your discipline in environmental engineering as a whole? The U of A specifically um, will be soon splitting off into its own separate program. Um, so it will no longer be civil environmental engineering. There will be a separate environmental engineering degree. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of um, new, interesting courses um, within that. Uh, I don't want to quote any of the specific courses, um, but I have been read off some of them from a list because I um, fortunately have a relationship with uh, the professor who's in charge of developing that program. Um, and let's just say I'm, I'm a little jealous of the people who are going to get to do <laughs> environmental engineering after that program launches, which should be in the next like one or two years. Um, I think generally like environmental engineering is going to only get um, higher demand in the future. Um, because we have a lot more sort of general awareness now with the public of like the challenges facing the environment. Like we've got um, like climate change, of course, um, and more awareness around like just generally how human development affects and, and impacts the environment. So I think there's going to be like plenty of jobs available in like site remediation, reclamation, um, looking at impact assessment. People seem to be a lot more aware of those things. Um, so there'll be higher demand for those jobs. Um, and then obviously, like, we all need to drink water, we all produce waste, um, and uh, landfills is another thing that environmental engineers specialize in. So um, a lot of these things, like, they're not going anywhere, um, probably ever. Um, so there's, there's always going to be demand for environmental engineers. Let's speak a little bit more about your work experience. What did you do um, for each of those work experiences that you had so far? Yeah, um, so my first co-op term, I spent working at a consulting firm working primarily in uh, land development. So I was doing um, sort of the basic design of the civil services of like new subdivisions for the most part. Um, so what that looked like is I'd be um, looking at like um, the, the site plan, um, and doing some estimations of like what the stormwater would look like, where that water is going to go, how big the pipes have to be, um, where the manholes should go based on like the site grading. Um, and then in addition to that, I go out and do like some construction supervision after the fact. Um, my second co-op term, I worked for uh, an NGO, a nonprofit um, that does uh, environmental science training with indigenous communities. Um, so that was uh, a quite a change of pace from my first co-op job. Um, I was working in uh, sometimes very remote indigenous communities, leading community workshops on how to do um, environmental water um, and uh, other like environmental sampling. Um, so even like catching fish, um, I had to learn how to like dissect fish Whoa, and differentiate yeah. like male and female fish, like when doing a dissection, which is I, I had to like revisit a lot of biology that I hadn't thought of since the 11th grade. Um, which I found that a really cool experience. Um, and then uh, my most recent co-op term, I worked for another consulting firm, but this time in Edmonton. This time I was working in their uh, regional water division. So I'd be working in primarily um, rural uh, communities and or on reserves um, and doing sort of assessments of the um, water infrastructure. So a lot of um, reserves in Canada and even some like um, just rural communities that aren't uh, indigenous will use um, what's called cisterns for their water. Um, so what they have is they'll have like a centralized distribution point where a truck will fill up and then the truck will bring water um, and fill up a, an underground tank at the household. And that's where the household will draw their water from. So the community isn't connected by like a distribution piping system. Um, or sometimes if they are, it's a low pressure system. So it'll fill their house tank um, really slowly, um, but then they can use 
um, the volume of water that's in their tank. Um, they'll have like a pump set up at their house as well. So I was doing assessments of, of those systems. Um, I did some supervision of construction where they were being replaced or had recently been replaced. Um, that's a lot of what I did. And then I um, got to do some work inside some uh, water treatment plants as well during the summer. In terms of personality, what kind of student do you, th- do you think should join this program? People who have an interest in like infrastructure as well, there's like still a lot of overlap with civil. And even if the program um, sort of specializes further in the future, I think that'll remain. Um, so if you're interested in like like civil services, if you, you know, grew up like looking at like roads and bridges and pipelines and stuff and, and that in- sort of stuff interests you, um, definitely. But also for people who are like, passionate about the environment and about preserving it and sustainable development and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think like environmental engineering is the most obvious home for them. Like I'm finding is um, pretty common across uh, people that I've met um, working in industry is also like an interest in just like getting outdoors. Um, Because as an environmental engineer, whether you're working in construction or whether you're working in like environmental impact assessments or site assessments or you know, water treatment, what have you, going out into the field to um, like examine sites or to see how projects are going or to, you know, like it's a lot of getting hands on and getting outside. Um, And that's one of the things that I really like about it. Um, It's nice being in the office sometimes, um, but I don't want to be working a job that I'm stuck behind a desk all the time or that I'm working in a lab all the time. Um, so that was one of the things that drew me to the discipline as well. Now we've got engineering physics where we'll talk about what engineering physics is, the courses you take in engineering physics, and it's two branches being nano and regular, what Keaton, our student here, did for his co-op placements, why students should choose EngPhys considering its size, in our university it's relatively small, and the one major piece of advice he has for all future students. Engineering physics. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Introduce yourself really quick. Uh, Say your I'm name. Keaton Hiltz. I'm a third year co-op engineering physics student. And uh, yeah, I'm vibing. I don't know. <laughs> I'm on my work term right now and it's awesome not to be a student. That's all I got to say. Oh, yeah, man. Is this your first one? No, I'm on my second work term now. Second work term. Sweet. So tell me a little bit about your discipline. I know next to nothing about EngPhys. EngPhys? But tell me about engineering sure. physics. Sure. It is probably the least engineering discipline out of all the engineering disciplines. But uh, it's really interesting. You know, you get to learn a lot of theoretical physics, but you still get to learn all the engineering fundamentals that you need to branch out. But you get way more theoretical stuff than any of the other engineering disciplines. Like we get to solve advanced differential equations, uh, theoretical electromagnetism problems, quantum mechanics, all the all the shebang. But uh, And we get the fundamentals of electrical or engineering in general. But um, okay. I guess that would be a good sort of... Description, you learn a lot of, uh, you learn the knowledge you would need to make advanced technology. So tell me about some of the courses that you learn in EngPhys. Well, for starters, you have the nano option and the regular option, just like electrical engineering. I don't know if any other disciplines have that, but uh, nano and regular, I'm in regular. So regular takes a bit more electrical engineering courses, whereas nano, you get a bit more physics, theoretical physics sort of stuff. Um, for me, a lot of engineering physics is actually electrical engineering. Like we take a lot of the same courses, uh, circuit theory, signals and systems, all that sort of stuff. Along with the standard maths, we learn uh, differential equations. Like I'm sure the Mechie learned that stuff too. Yeah. Um, but then a bit, a bit later, like in second year, we also take a modern physics class, which none of the other engineering disciplines take. We also take an experimental physics class where you get to do like physics labs, which is pretty interesting there. And then as you get a bit higher into like third and fourth year, you start taking more theoretical courses, quantum mechanics, statistical physics, condensed matter physics. You take that sort of stuff. It starts off basic engineering, a lot of electrical engineering. And then as you get higher and higher, you start moving away from electrical engineering into theoretical physics is what you're learning mostly by the end of it. Mm. So you mentioned that you're in co-op. So yes. go ahead, just kind of explain what you did for your first co-op and maybe what you're doing right now. Yeah, sure. First of all, co-op is a dream. It gives you a break from school, which is so nice because ooh, school sucks sometimes. But yeah, so for my first co-op term, it was a four-month term and I just did a pretty basic research position with one of my professors. I actually, my circuit theory professor started offering uh, research positions in his lab. So I, I messaged him and he said, yeah, like I know you from class. Like I like you, you can come work for me. The only condition for that is I needed to get a scholarship from some organization, which I was able to get that way it, paid for me to do that because for co-op you need to be making at least minimum wage or else you like they won't let you work the job Mm. so that was kind of the problem working research but yeah I I worked in a chemistry lab Uh, 
designing and characterizing a specific type of molecule for optoelectronic devices. Um, it was pretty basic stuff. I was just doing, like working in a chemistry lab, making molecules, making solutions and stuff, and then taking it down to the nanofab and doing some characterization. Not like pretty beginner stuff. I think a lot of people mm. could do that even if they weren't in Eng Phys, but uh, that was, I felt pretty in tune with what I would learned doing that position, working in like a chemistry lab, making this sort of um, molecule stuff. It would be I feel like if I tried to explain it, it might get a little blah, 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 gobbledygook. But. but right now I'm working for the NRC uh, right next to the McKay building, and I'm doing a lot of microfabrication, uh, microelectromechanical system actuator design, which is super cool. That I feel like total EngFizz, like that's exactly what I would imagine when I think EngFizz. So I'm super happy that I got to work there. I'm working there right now. And it's pretty similar to what I did. Like I work a lot in the lab. I work a lot in the nanofab. But I also work a lot from my desk, just like reading papers a lot of the time. Probably once I get more results, get more into it. I've only been working there for about, uh, you know, a month now. Once I get more into it, I'll probably be doing a lot of data analysis on my computer and stuff. But it's a lot of spending hours in the, nan in the nanofab uh, doing fabrication processes, learning all that stuff, lithography, uh, mask aligning, all sorts of blah, 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 gobbledygook terms that mm. people aren't going to recognize. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying it. So in terms of work, mm -hmm. actual work, yeah. engineering work, what can it branch into? Yeah, so one of my favorite parts about engineering physics that I've come to realize kind of immersing myself in the discipline is that I feel as though with a little bit of extra elbow grease, I could go into any industry I wanted to. Mm. Like we learn the fundamentals, I think, at least, for electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, computer engineering. I feel like those four pillars, we could branch out into any one of those if we really tried to. Electrical engineering is definitely the most suitable because we learn tons of electrical engineering courses, but we also get enough that if we pushed ourselves further, we could branch out into really anything you wanted. That's the mm -hmm. vibe that I'm feeling. But definitely electronics would be the, the easiest cookie cutter thing to go into afterwards. Electronics and um, device fabrication sort of stuff is basically what you're set up for, but it really gives you a lot of options. So this is something that I wanted to bring up. Sure. Is the size of engineering physics yes. in terms of population. Will at least people go into engineering physics out of definitely. all of them? Yeah, I think... Petroleum engineering might be the smallest or mining or something, but it's, it's right. definitely down there. In my uh, year, there was only like not even 20 people, I think, or like oh. around 20 people in my year. Wow. So I don't know, maybe for some people you don't like that, but I honestly really like having a small group because I know everyone in my year. We all right. were like, we're all homies. We sit together, we eat lunch together. Like it's honestly uh. really nice because I feel like I could go up to anyone else in engineering physics and just strike up a conversation. With it being so small though. Why uh -huh. should people go for EngFizz, in your opinion, instead of instead one of the of, other major branches? Like For me, at least, I didn't think about these things beforehand, but now that I'm in it, I've been there for like two years now. Like I said, everyone in EngFizz is a really good friend of mine, Like, <laughs> which is just kind of a cool thing to think about versus if I was in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, sure, you'd have friend groups and whatnot, but I know every single person like super close in my discipline, so it's just a really tight-knit sort of community. Everyone talks to each other, but it's really nice having a little tight knit, almost like a family. Yeah. To go oh, into. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you can make Sweet. the same connections in any engineering discipline, really. But uh, yeah. the size isn't something that you should worry about, I don't think, because everyone's got your back. What is your one piece of advice that you would give any student that wants to join your discipline? Right. Okay. So if I could give, if I go back and give myself one piece of advice uh, for engineering physics specifically, I would say to really think hard about whether you're going to go into nano or the regular, because I'm in, I'm in regular. But now the work that I'm doing, if I would have taken nano, I would have been a lot more, a lot better prepared for what I'm doing right now. So it's kind of unfortunate. I wish I would have put more thought into thinking on oh, which one. I just, I, I was a little intimidated by nano at first. So I just was like, okay, do the regular one. But if I could give someone some advice, I would say really look into the courses you're going to take and consider which one before you apply for it. And your shirt <laughs> for the very last thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I ate some pie. Bro, I couldn't believe it, bro. <laughs> Next, we've got petroleum engineering, where we'll talk about why students should choose petroleum engineering, one of the biggest misconceptions about petroleum engineering, which is pretty interesting. It's not all about oil and gas. The courses you take, what petroleum engineers can participate in extracurricular activities, the future of petroleum engineering, what Colby's internship positions were like, and what to expect for industries and positions that petroleum engineering opens you up to. Hello, I'm Colby Pilling. I'm in my fifth and final year of petroleum engineering. So why did you choose your discipline? It was kind of a uh, something I wasn't 
thinking I would ever want to go into, but it turns out that I initially wanted to go into environmental because I wanted to do something with renewable energy. Mm. And the more I learned about petroleum and the more I learned about environmental separately, I noticed that they were not interrelated at all. And there's not really energy engineering that can be done through environmental. So it was actually really, really exciting that I could go into petroleum engineering and pursue something like that renewable energy that I was interested in. So, Mm. yeah. (laughs) That's interesting because when you think petroleum engineering, you don't really think renewable energy. Exactly. Yeah, that's what uh, I think a common misconception of petroleum is. Obviously, it's uh, you can do traditional oil and gas, but you can also go and use all of the skills that you learn from that and put it on to renewable energy systems because ah. they follow the same types of principles and all of that. So, Interesting. Yeah. Tell me about some of the courses that you take in school. Sure. Uh, so for petroleum engineering, I guess there are a few different categories of courses that we take. Once you graduate, you can go into a couple different fields of petroleum. So we kind of have courses that are specific for that. So we take a drilling uh, engineering course where we learn all about how they drill the well bores to go into the reservoirs downhole. Um, We also take a few production classes where we get to learn about reservoirs and all of the different reservoir properties like permeability, porosity, all of that stuff. Um, And then we also take a lot of geology courses, which is something that I didn't realize that is super important for petroleum. But um, you kind of need to know what the formation and what the rock types are downhole and what kind of classifies a good reservoir. Uh, So we take a lot of those. And then um, we also branch off into our final year. We take uh, an economics course where we kind of learn about oil and gas property evaluation. So speak on the extracurricular side of things. What clubs have you been a part of? Um, This is my second year being the president of the SPE, which is the Society of Petroleum Engineers, University of Alberta chapter. Um, We put together an Energizing Tomorrow conference back in October, and it was put on partnership with the Canadian Energy Executive Association. So it's a bunch of company presidents and CEOs uh, that come together and are part of this organization. And we were specifically working with the advocacy program. We were able to really focus on Uh, topics like energy security, energy reliability, and then to finish off the day, we talked about energy technology and innovations that are happening in the energy industry. And it was a phenomenal turnout. We had a networking session afterwards, and it was phenomenal to do that networking face-to-face with industry professionals and talk about their experiences and how we're about to be a part of that industry. What do you see as the future in your discipline, however? Um, The future is, uh, it's definitely a a hot topic, I guess. It's a de- question for debate for sure. We've uh, seen decreases in our enrollment, which is not the best thing to have happen, but I think it's just because there's a little bit of a misconception between what petroleum engineers do and where the oil and gas industry is going. Um, I like to look at it as like a opportunity to expand what we have, and that's why I have such an interest in the renewable energy systems, just because what we're learning is so applicable in that field. Um, It would be really nice if we could potentially rebrand into something away from the word petroleum and just go broader with energy because there is so much um, stuff that we can work in that people I just think aren't aware of. And especially um, the energy industry is so interdisciplinary. Um, Like, for example, in my past internship, there was two petroleum students and the rest were a mix of mechanical and chemical just because all of our stuff is kind of intertwined where we can work in the same industry. So I think people just don't see that. So I think once that barrier is kind of broken down, we can kind of see the future being a little more bright because oil and gas is very important in our everyday lives. And I don't think it's going to go down anytime soon. So um, I think we just need to be smarter about how we approach certain areas of it in terms of like our emissions and stuff. And I think that we are the type of engineering discipline that's going to kind of working, I guess, towards that solution because we've kind of have the knowledge of how it's done so we can kind of make it cleaner from what we know already. Okay, well, uh, speaking about your internship, though, can you tell me a little bit about what you did? Yeah, so I worked as a relief operator summer student. So what I would do is I would go to different wells and take samples of the oil, and I would test for the different water cuts that are there. Basically, when there is a producing well, you want to have more oil than water that's produced. So my job was to check if there was more water being produced, because then that well might not be as viable as one that has a letter a less water cut right for summer students you could either be in the battery doing um all the produced oil that was there you'd kind of I, I wasn't there so i um i think you just 
desand and all that stuff, but I was in the, the field part of the summer student. So it was, I got my own truck, I got to drive around to different well sites and just do the oil tests and stuff like that, so. Well, speaking on industries, well, it seems kind of like self-explanatory what industry you would want to go to. <laughs> but um, what industries do you think that this discipline like opens you up to? Uh, maybe some industries that people don't really think about. I would say, obviously, you can work in primarily oil and gas. We're, uh, right. Petroleum engineers mainly work upstream. Upstream is like where you're actually doing the production engineering and all of that, where you're, the oil is actually coming out of the ground. But um, I think for other companies, you could also work more midstream, which is all the transportation of it through pipelines or um, in all, like to the refineries and stuff. So you could also work there. But I guess my biggest in interest is in the renewable section. So it's kind of... Um, up and coming. I know one of our professors does a, a lot of research in hydrogen energy, which is a big, a big and upcoming thing right now. It's just um, very expensive to get off the ground, so it's kind of facing some backlash that way. That it's it's hard to like go really for it because it's so expensive. But right. stuff like that is up and coming. So I think there's a lot of new technologies that are emerging in the next couple of years where we can kind of branch out into kind of wherever we want into the energy industry. So yeah, it's a it's a very broad industry and it's just always changing so it's a very exciting discipline to be in is there anything else that you like kind of like really want to share like that people don't really know or like misconceptions stuff like that um i'd probably say the biggest misconception is that you don't need to be in the field okay for it like i think a lot of people think that they're going to be like remote in the middle of nowhere which you can be like that my job was in the middle of nowhere this summer and i did shift work seven days on seven days off which is pretty nice, like it was a good, um, I guess, look into what I could be doing as an EIT. Um, but you can also just go, like you can have an office job, like you can do different things like that. And I think a lot of people think you're gonna be like on a rig, drilling the yeah. oil yourself and all that, which is not necessarily the case, I guess, if you don't wanna go that route. You definitely can if you want to, but there's definitely more options than just going remote in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> okay, I like, how, I like that you said, um, you would want them to rebrand into energy engineering. Yeah, yeah. I think it would just kind of help that misconception right away. And if you hear energy, you just be like, oh, like I, in my opinion, I think I would, yeah. like I would change kind of where my thoughts are. Next we've got software engineering, AKA soft E. And first we'll talk about why students should choose soft E, how hackathons are great for software engineering students, courses that they take, what soft ease can take for extracurriculars, what Jared did, our student here, for his co-ops, what it's like working for a startup, the difference between ComSci and software engineering, and a hot topic, and how ChatGPT influenced the soft e space. My name is Jared. I'm a fourth year software engineering student studying at the University of Alberta. So why did you choose your discipline, uh, software engineering? Yeah, so I chose software engineering because I mainly enjoy the problem solving aspects of the fields, uh, especially when it comes to programming and computational thinking. I really like the concept of being able to build something that solves uh, a problem um, and this solution being accessible to uh, a mass amount of users. Mm, so like what what's like some of your favorite problems that you solve? They've usually stemmed from hackathons, which are these 24-hour uh, kind of coding competitions where your problem is to, uh, the purpose is to solve a problem within this uh, time constraint. And some of these problems sort of vary from accessibility issues or maybe things like that are related to the climate. Yeah, kind of building software projects that target areas like that. What are some of like the courses? Just briefly describe some of the courses that you take in software engineering. Yeah, so in software engineering, you mainly touch upon classes that are involved with software, um, but you also get to touch a lot of uh, hardware-related fields. For me, I have to take uh, classes that are also like related to chemistry or materials engineering. To be real, we don't really touch math like that oh, really? crazy uh, compared to like other engineering disciplines. Mainly a lot more coding um, and kind of design. Yeah. So speaking on the extracurricular side. What are some of the clubs that you've been a part of? Yeah, so throughout my academic career, I've been part of two main clubs. The first club is called Future Creators, centered around providing mentorship sessions um, 
to students in grades five to 12. And the other club is called Blueprint, um, where we essentially build software for nonprofit organization clients or uh, other mm -hmm. student clubs in the university. Just to be a little more general, say they want to have something that seems like a more manual process um, that they do like every day. Um, oh, they kind of just want to turn that into like a web application that they can um, easily access and is a little more automated. I'm guessing that you've had two previous co-ops, right? Yep, that's right. Okay, can you speak on a little bit on both of them? Yeah, sure. So uh, in my co-op experience, I've mainly worked at startups. So you know how healthcare related companies, they go through a whole manual collection of claims. That company pretty much made a software or infrastructure that automated that whole process. Um, and I was a software developer for that, for that company. My first one was uh, for a much smaller startup. Um, it was pretty much building software features for kind of like consulting and uh, contract management. Yeah, working at a startup is definitely uh, fast paced, which I honestly I think is a is a good uh, learning opportunity, um, just because you you're forced to kind of. Uh, develop software at an agile pace while trying to maintain like a certain type of quality of code. You do get to work a little more closely with um, the client that you're working with. It's kind of like, you know, whatever bug fix or feature you're building one day, you, you might be able to see it the next day. So there is that sort of direct impact. Uh, it's, uh, it is kind of satisfying, but also yeah. a little scary at the same time. <laughs> oh, why is it scary? I uh, will say you make a feature and then it turns out to be bugged. Oh. <laughs> you just see that in production the next day and it's like, oh, I gotta fix that. Yeah. <laughs> so just like compared to other disciplines, I feel like it's a little more, um, it's easier to deploy your applications or whatever you're building and see other people use it um, and solve a certain problem as opposed to maybe other disciplines where it's a little more bureaucratic to do that. Like I forget from the last time we talked, were, did, were you more interested in the front or back end? Yeah, I guess for me, I'm more interested in the front end uh, engineering right now, mainly because I kind of like have a knack for design um, and building user interfaces. That's sort of uh, what I'm into right now. Okay, but it also opens up, like, the discipline also opens up to the back end as well, I'm assuming as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think it's software engineering since you do get to um, kind of touch upon hardware stuff too. There's, mm -hmm. it kind of opens up fields um, that are related to the hardware as well. And I'm sure this is the burning question that everyone is wondering. What is the difference between software engineering and computer science? About to start a war. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the main difference uh, based on like my interactions with my CS friends um, and just my personal experience in software eng, um, I think in software engineering there is quite a bit more work, um, like the workload is a little more since you do take, um, you know, ECE classes alongside CS classes. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's one of the main differences, uh, just sort of the gap between workload. So I think the main benefit of pursuing software engineering over CS is you, you kind of just start to build a good habit of uh, like a good study habit and kind of the whole grind mentality. In engineering, you do get to um, touch upon like a lot of math, like in your first couple of years. Yeah. That does come in pretty handy when you're trying to get into, say, some research positions. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's kind of like that interdisciplinary aspect of being in software eng um, does kind of help with that. You know? And um, ChatGPT. Okay. <laughs> How has it impacted your discipline and like the people around you, like when it came out, what was your guys' reaction and how does it kind of integrate into your discipline now? I feel like it's more of a tool rather than um, something that you should rely on. In terms of how it's affecting like uh, my experience in this field, it's definitely like a really good uh, resource for learning something. The initial reaction, I mean, there's obviously that extreme side where it's like, oh my gosh, it's gonna replace programmers. But then when you kind of actually start using it, uh, you realize that you, it requires a lot more um, prompt engineering to kind of get to uh, the output that you want. So yeah, definitely more of a, a tool rather than uh, something to rely on. Right. It's, it's kind of easy to differentiate between code that's generated from GPT sometimes, mm -hmm. especially if it's like, um, 
I don't know exactly how to smell it. There's like, it's kind of like this uh, concept of like a code smell or whatever. Oh, it's like, okay. it, it kind of looks sus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, so yeah. And now we've got biomedical engineering, where first we'll talk about the difference between mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering, what it's like for Connor, our student here, to run two companies at the same time. As a biomed student, by the way, the advantages that biomed students have over traditional engineering students, the industries that biomed engineering opens you up to, how biomed combines biology and engineering together, and an entire talk about his biomedical company, Wound Cubed. If you're interested in entrepreneurship in biomedical engineering, this is gonna be a really great insight for you in the future. Hi, uh, I'm Connor Pavlito and I'm in my fifth year at university. So I know that there is some kind of like relationship between mechanical and biomedical engineering. Right. Um, can you speak on the specific kind of courses that um, skew towards biomedical engineering, like that kind of diverge mechanical and biomedical engineering? Yeah, so there's, there's two components that sort of diverge from mechanical engineering and, and the biomedical side. So part of it is the coursework and then part of it is the co-op placement. So I'll start with the co-op placement because it's a, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, essentially, one um, gets to swap one of their uh, co-op placements for an additional academic term. And in that academic term, uh, it kind of gives space for some of the biomedical related courses. So you lose one co-op term. And then additionally, one of your other still remaining co-op terms is uh, work experience 906, which is defined as uh, some clinical placement. And so what that means is you have to, you know, do some sort of, of biomedical work in industry uh, during that 906 period. You can't just pick any company. Um, now, Looking back at the coursework, uh, the courses that you might take in um, biomed are related to kind of basic anatomy and physiology. Uh, so that's BME 320 and 321. Uh, so you learn, you know, sort of basic, you know, cranial anatomy, the, the spine, how your muscles work, right. different sorts of stuff like that. And then, uh, and then there's also a few biomedical options that you can, that, well, I guess you're required to take a handful of them. And so that can be you know, organic chemistry, it can be different courses related to medical imaging and, and so forth. So yeah, that, that, that's more or less the difference. It's kind of like exactly what you'd think, um, except maybe the co-op term. Most people wouldn't, I guess, immediately think that that would be the case, but right. essentially you just do some bio courses and, and they have like an engineering emphasis. I think this is, this is the important part um, that they're taught in a way that's similar to the other engineering courses in terms of, I guess, applied theory more than right. sort of theory in a vacuum. Um, and that might be, that might differ it from like a traditional biology course you might see in the faculty of science, for example. So, so most of it's like, okay, we're learning anatomy and then all of the projects are like, okay, now how do you, you know, build on some system that might interface with muscles? Like mm -hmm. that's the way you're kind of thinking about it. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the general difference. It's just that co-op placement and then also the the additional courses. Well, speaking on the extracurricular side, um, have you been part of any clubs that were like related to biomedical engineering? Related to biomedical engineering, no. Uh, but I, but I, I've been I've been in clubs and yeah. I've, I've done I've done well extracurriculars, not necessarily at the university, but I have I have a company that's biomedical related. So I'll go chronologically. And Level Seven Plastics is a uh, student group I started in 2019, and. Uh, that group is essentially a group that recycles plastic on campus. So it has absolutely nothing to do with, with biomed, but it is an extracurricular and we recycle plastic. We make benches, we make bricks, beams. Um, that was sort of like my, my primary academic project during my undergrad. Yeah, in the middle of my second year, I decided, you know what? I have to do something a little bit more sustainable. I'll have to you know, establish a corporate entity and, and you know, generate revenue. And then I can yeah. sort of rely on that entity over time to, to, to do something positive. And so, uh, this was Wound Cubed is, is what I started. And that's what I spend the vast majority of my time on. Um, and this is biomedical related. Basically, I have a company that writes software that measures wounds. Think like an ulcer or something like this uh, that someone might have. You know, you might have some like bowl shape ulcer. And we write software that basically uh, takes an image of that wound and then transposes it into 3D space and then runs different analytics on it to see, you know, are you at risk for infection? Is this oh. kind of more inflamed than it previously was? 
And so, yeah, that's, that's what I spend the, the significant majority of my time on. Um, I have a few employees uh, as well, and all of us together are uh, kind of building this app, getting it regulated, getting it into clinic. So that's sort of an overview, high-level overview. Sweet. Well, I'd like to hear more about that later on, definitely. Cool. Well, what would you say kind of that some of the industries that would open up from biomedical engineering? So one of the things that I really like about biomedical engineering um, and mechanical engineering kind of has this feature too, but especially the, the biomed specialization is it, it's wickedly general. And that's something you might not expect. You might go like, okay, well, if, if I'm doing biomedical engineering, I'm yeah. sort of constrained to biomedical fields. The, the thing that's awesome about biomedical engineering is you sort of learn from example um, from sort of evolved features in the circulatory system, respiratory system. And you sort of learn from example on how to build really well-optimized systems that have um, general uses. So, so uh, let, let me maybe give you an example, and it might, might constrain what, I, what I'm describing a little bit better. Um, if, if you are thinking about designing a super efficient, really compact heat exchanger, for example, this is a mechanical problem yeah. um, by virtue. But... Uh, if you take inspiration from the circulatory system in the foot of a horse, for example, um, you can start to look at the way uh, you know a horse's foot is, is sort of architected, and the, and the way it works is, you know, there's 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 sort of vessels going out to the foot and then back up to the heart. Right? What you see is the arteries that go out to the foot are wrapped in a coil around the the vein that goes back up to the heart. And it's okay. coiled around. You might go, like, why is that, right? Yeah. And then the, well, the, the reason why is because the blood coming back to the heart from the foot goes back at the same temperature as the, as the blood that goes down to the foot. So, so the blood goes down to the foot. It heats the foot with, with, with the blood. And then it cools down. Now the blood is, you know, lo at a lower temperature right. than your core. But you don't want that blood going back and then cooling down your core temperature. Right. And so, so there's this really awesome evolved feature where you see like the, the artery sort of coil around the vein and then heats the I blood see. that comes back. And so it comes back at a higher temperature. So it's, it's a really elegant solution and a very compact solution that basically says, how do I not drop like the core temperature of this thing? And you can take that in a vacuum and look at it, at, kind of look at the structure of that coiled complex and, and understand it as a heat exchanger and sort of study how it's Whoa. formed and things like this. And then and you get a really elegant solution. And, and that works in a, lot of, in a lot of similar ways. You know, like you, you can do the same thing with software. Like if, if you have a basic understanding of the, the axons and neurons in your brain work, you can start to map out, you know, artificial intelligence networks a little bit more intuitively. You know what I mean? Using yeah. that background intelligence. Huh. And, and so, so it, it's really odd how, how, how much you can kind of link back to, to, to biomedical uh, information. It's just a really good frame of reference to make systems that can do multiple things. Now, now the, the only thing that it wouldn't be good for, and I like to give this caveat, is if you're looking to do something really specific large number of times. So I don't know if I was making, um, so I was manufacturing like these plugs, for example. You know right. what I mean? Like I need to make these prongs and I need to do that a lot. Yeah. So you might like stamp them, for example, to manufacture this part. Um, you know, there's basically nothing you can get from biomedical from okay. a biomedical frame of reference to yeah. do that, like a repetitive standard task. But if you're like, okay, I want to build an arm that might be able to do anything, you know what I mean? Then you, you know, looking at biological systems is just awesome. And now to answer your question directly, you, you asked, okay, uh, what, what industries is it open you up towards? I would say it opens you up to any sort of innovative work where the objective is to do something generally that's that's what it opens you up to do so if you want to go into make some if you're interested in chemistry and you want to make some chemical process that, that might be self-regulating uh, i think a biological system would be good to study if you want to make a pro, you know if you're a programmer and you want to make a neural network that might mimic human intelligence i think it's good to have some fundamental understanding of biology uh, if you want to make some mechanical system that can traverse in a crazy number of dimensions, you know, um, like looking at your hand, for example, it's a good thing to study biology. Uh, and so I, I don't think it's very, very much constrained. I think it's more of a question of what can't you do? And like I said, it's just repetitive yeah. manufacturing tasks. Well, breaking down like biomedical engineering itself. 
So I just want to know, like, what is the weighting between the biology aspect of it and the engineering aspect of it? If you're doing heat exchangers, for example, um, in, in mechanical engineering, I know we talked about heat exchangers earlier, so I'll go on this theme. Like, basically, in your second year of university mechanical engineering, you just you basically learn what an air conditioner is and you basically learn yeah. how to make it. Um, you can do that, I think, in mechanical engineering because those systems are relatively simple. Um, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's, there's not a ton of moving parts. In biology, though, there's, there's, there's a ton to know before you start just doing stuff with it. Like the problems in biomed, um, the, the biomed courses, I guess, tend to focus on are things like how do you how do you give a quadriplegic movement? You know what I mean? This is sort of some of the ideas that, that, are, that are talked about. And so, okay, so to do that, you have to understand a bit about the motor cortex. You have to understand how to read signals in the motor cortex. And then you need to understand how to animate nerves thereafter and maybe jolt arms around um, or connect that to some, you know, other system um, like a mouse cursor. So like what Neuralink is doing, for example. And then you know, digitize thoughts. And so these are the types of problems that are sort of brought up in focus in any of the biomed courses. And that's not something you can just like engineer off the bat. You know what I mean? There's a lot of like preface to kind of go through there. Yeah. And so, and so, okay. Now so to answer your, your question, um, th there's, there's a lot of engineering in terms of you're encouraged to be thinking about things that way. Um, but it's not as, as hands-on, I guess, as, as a lot of, the other uh, engineering disciplines in undergrad. It's more of a preface. What did you do for your co-ops? Huh, yeah, so this is actually fun. Um, and my, my business partner, again, Jacob's man, he's a great guy. Um, the two of us ended up buying ourselves out of every co-op. So starting in our first year, we registered our company with the co-op office, and then we hired ourselves for all of our co-op terms. And uh, yeah, we also have, bro. <laughs> yeah, we've also hired a ton of other co-op students this is both for level seven, that plastic recycling facility I'd mentioned. Mm -hmm. This is again a bit more of a research group, so it's not as corporate, which I don't talk about it that way. But um, yeah, we take on co-op students like a few a year for the level seven side, and then we do tons of co-op students for for um, with the Wound Cube, including us. We were the first ones, um, and for Wound Cube, we mostly pull co-op students out of UFT because their their AI programs are pretty awesome, wow. and so they have like a lot of great great programmers over there but but yeah that's so i've i've never done a co-op position actually mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough i did I, I did one position at a real company um once i did it in florida um i moved down to the u.s to work at a, at a surgical company they what they did was they like 3d printed like like if you get in a bad car accident and shatter your jaw they'll like print you a new jaw to titanium and then Surgeons are surgically implanted. It's super cool. Well, and actually, from those five co-op terms that Jake and I did, um, and, and you know all of the other people that you know we, we would have hired, um, that was like the beginning of what this uh, new e-co-op program is. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard of that in yeah. the faculty. Yeah, the engineer the entrepreneurship yeah. co-op program at the ice incubator there. Yeah. So this is like it's yeah. The, the, those five co-ops were the sort of the precursor of what led to the development. And it wasn't totally, of course, there's a lot of stuff that the co-op office did. Nonetheless, like the, we were sort of the, with those five co-op terms, were sort of the guinea pigs of the e-co-op program. Ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. What is your one piece of advice that you would give to a, a student that wants to go into biomedical engineering? Be useful. Like, be useful. Uh, be useful. Yeah, like, and this is just what I, uh, anytime I'm asked that question, that's usually my response. If you're going to spend time working on anything or you're going to learn something in a class, it's of the utmost importance to constantly think about um, how the application of those ideas might be able to help people. You know, if, you're, if, if one's convinced that, you know what, I'm learning in school and I'm applying the things I'm learning in school in a way that I believe will genuinely help, you know, some, some, some suffering uh, I, I believe that's that's the best way to go about anything. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. So, so for my company, Wound Cubed. Yeah. So, so w what we do at Wound Cubed is we we basically make software that transforms eye devices into medical scanners. Okay, that's, that's crazy, man. That's what we do. Um, and so, so essentially, where we're starting is we're starting with um, with wound care. We're starting with specifically diabetic foot ulcers, which is a very common, right? Uh, sort of. Uh, issue that uh, presents to diabetic patients, and these things are very painful. Um, in severe cases, they lead to amputation. 
and sort of diabetic foot ulcer related complications um, kill a lot, many people per year. And so yeah. what we do is we build software that basically allows patients or clinicians to download, um, you know, it's called Wound Cubed onto their just iPhone or iPad. So it's like an app. It's an app. And, okay. and what the app does is basically comes with a ton of software that's really good at taking um, information that your your phone can capture and projecting that into 3D space. Whoa. It sort of renders uh, wounds in 3D. It sort of analyzes the, the growth patterns of that wound over time and, and has a lot of data visualization features. So this is not like some like special camera then this is like just a, like a regular iphone samsung camera yeah that's that's our advantage is um is, is how scalable the software is yes yeah, okay. so so actually one sec yeah but yeah here it is so this read that wound ruler what it what is it this is the standard of care that's used in most clinics this is a paper oh, ruler. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do you see how there's a pamphlet of all of these things on here? Oh. So, so what people oh. do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, so, so, yeah. What happens is, you know, you'd go and you'd tear this thing off because you don't want to reuse them because right. it might get contaminated, right? Obviously. So you tear this off, right? And then if this is the wound, this section here, I like put it over like that. Okay, it's about three and a half centimeters wide. Gosh, it's about you know. Four, what does that even just tell over you? four and a half. Exactly. What does that even correlate to? So precisely. Um, so, so, so we just measured about three and a half by about four and a half centimeters. And so then that would get, you know, written down in the chart. There's generally no supplementary visual information. Yeah. And so you just have like a length width. And then that's how wounds are, are sort of measured with time. And so it's very difficult, you could imagine, to, to then optimize what kind of wound dressing one might use to um, honestly even tell if a wound is healing properly. Right. So this is the first issue, is, is all the data in terms of its retrospective utility is very poor. But then also um, you get into the fact that you always have to come to clinic to take the measurement. And so generally, people come into clinic every two weeks, maybe, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on this specific case. But you, know, you, you have to drive in. You have to get a healthcare professional that's expensive on, on an, in terms of an hourly rate yeah. to come like, do this measurement, to write it down. And it's kind of you know, suboptimal. And so what we do is, is, yeah, we build software that basically just uses your phone, leverages your phone. It can render the entire wound in, in, in 3D space, and it can show you it growing and shrinking with time. It can plot what? those analytics uh, yeah, on graphs. And you can also do interesting things, like we have this feature called the time machine that's pretty cool, okay. where it'll kind of take all of the 3D models of the wound over time, sort of standardize them to some some common datum. And then we have a, a, like a scroller feature that allows you to just render the wound changing <laughs> with time, right? And I'll just show you the date. And so you can see all of this like like it's so fun. clearly and so easily. And, and and so the data collection is better, but then also now you don't have to come into clinic to take the measurement. Yeah. You know, you could take the measurement yourself at home, upload it to the EMR, and then the, the, the practitioner can review your file on the electronic medical record and then decide if they should or shouldn't bring you in. You know what I mean? Like it just makes infinite sense from a scalability perspective. And so this, yeah, this is the software we build. We're going through regulatory right now. We're going through FDA and Health Canada regulatory, and sure. uh, we're hoping to get into clinic this year. How much does the software cost? Yeah, um, it, it sort of depends like on how many users you have and, and things like that. Ah, so it, it, we sort of work with clinics directly to put together that figure, but it's significantly cheaper no matter how you chop it up than, than paying uh, a healthcare aid. Yeah. Because you, you have to think too, like it's not only cheaper from a per measurement perspective, but it's, it's also more revenue generating um, because you can take in many more patients, right? When you decentralize mm -hmm. your measurement, which is like, pretty trivial in terms of wound care like it's a very you know technically articulate field but if you can sort of decentralize the the easy part which is just the measurements then you can focus on taking in and scheduling patients that have all the hard stuff you know what i mean and and so and you can manage more patients and so <laughs> it, it, yeah like when you say it makes makes so much sense right yeah. that uh, that it doesn't the fact that something like this doesn't exist and, and the ruler is the most common approach. You want to know what the second is? The, 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 the high-tech approach? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the ruler is the most common. 
Um, then the high tech, the high tech approach is um, you guys remember like transparencies, like maybe you guys like overheads? oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. the clear sheets of acetate. Like swear to God, you know, you take this clear sheet of paper, <laughs> don't right? tell me, put it over the wound, trace, <laughs> trace it. it. <laughs> swear to God, trace it with a sharpie, <laughs> and then uh, yeah, then then pull out scissors, <laughs> cut it out, right? Cut out your trace and then weigh it. And then what? The, the change in weight over time implies a change oh in days. So, so you say a higher weight correlates to more area. And so, yeah, that's like, like, no, I'm like not even kidding. And, uh, you know what too, the, the other thing is you think about that from like an operations perspective and you're like, that's unbelievable. Yeah. And then, uh, but then also if you think about it for a minute, like, okay, what does this imply about the state of the wound? The, 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 if you're going to project something onto a 2D sheet or you're going to take length width and measure a two-dimensional yeah. sort of thing, um, the the implicit assumption that sort of happens there is that the wound is planar by nature, yeah. right? But but this is not the way that wounds heal. There's like depth. if you think of, yeah, exactly, there's depth. And not only is there depth, but wounds heal generally from the bottom up, right? They heal they, they 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 lose all their volume first, and then they so cinch in. You're not like finding the the recovery, yeah, based on like the cross sectional area of that like that top portion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so if you were to graph it, right, like if you were to graph like change in you know projected area with time, you'd sort of see a graph that sort of stalls, even if the wound is healing properly. You see sort of a graph that stalls and then sharply dips. And the sharp dip is right when the bottom part heals up and then it cinches inward. Uh, um, but while all the volume heals, you sort of see this like constant, you know, yeah. this sort of flat line. And it's a, it, in the graph, it looks like things aren't healing, even though it is. But if you take something more complicated like volume and you plot volume with time, you get something that, you know, it's sort of belly shaped. But it, it, you get a, a curve that a, somewhat approximates yeah. linear descent. And so, and so it, 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 yeah, it, it's very obvious to go, okay, well then we should be tracking wound healing progression using volume. Yeah. Right. But, but the, the reason why it's not done right now is because there's no, you know, really scalable computational way to do that. Uh, and so, so if you tell a clinic to do it right now, the first thing that would probably happen is you feel like a wound with like gel or clay or something and then measure the volume. But that's oh. you know, obviously painful oh. and obviously would contaminate something, right? So you, you don't want to do that. And so that's why it's not done. But if you take something like Wound Cubed, our software, when we mesh the wound, we also predict what that wound might look like when it's healed. And then we can measure the delta using some, some clever math. And so we can sort of, without even touching the patient, you can come up with a volume figure and, and, and then plot that instantly. So that's why it's called wound, wound cubed. cubed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the cubed is sense. volume. Yeah, yeah. the elusive volume metric that uh, wound care needs but doesn't particularly have yet. Yeah. It seems so obvious to like not go that route. Yeah, and this, this links back actually to what we were talking about, about like utility. Like, like when I mentioned, you know, if you go into engineering, just spend your time doing something useful. There's so many things like this, you know what I mean, that, that exist. Um, and so the two I tend to tackle is, is mostly wound care, but then I look at plastic recycling because I have some ideas about that too. And so, okay, I'm going to spend 100% of my time focusing on these two very practical things. Um, and so, honestly, I think anyone with an engineering degree uh, if, if if they're you know interested and, and willing, can can simply just you know take take a walk through a hospital or go through a waste management center or or, or go to you know any corner of any non technical sector in the world, and, and you will see so many of these things. There's there's so many latent ideas that are just waiting for innovation. Congratulations, you made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, and to all those that participated in the video, thank you so much, 100% big thank you to all of you and if you found value in this video make sure to hit like and hit that subscribe button because we're going to be posting way more engineering content in the future and i hope that it's going to be even more valuable to you and way more entertaining as well peace out everyone peace